Google. And contrary to the transcript, this is the workshop on supporting local content development. So I'm, ho I'm hoping we'll be uh, able to have a very robust conversation. We're joined by a number of people who have approached the issue of how to foster and encourage local content development from a variety of different perspectives. Um, I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to give a very brief introduction and then I think what we'll do is we'll, I'll ask a series of initial questions and then I'll open it up to all of you to ask your questions. Uh, so maybe we'll start with you, Michael. Hi, good morning. My name is Michael Kendi. Um, I just recently joined the Internet Society as Chief Economist. My name is Karen Rose, and I'm the Senior Director of Strategic Development and Business Planning at the Internet Society. Hi, it's I, Jamil. I'm from Fox. I'm an attorney, and we run the Center for Strategic and Policy Analysis. Thank you. Great. So I thought maybe I'd start by asking you, Karen. ISOC has done a number of initiatives in the area of developing infrastructure, and I know you've thought a lot about the relationship between infrastructure and fostering local content. And so if you could just share a couple learnings that you've had at a high level, and then I know Michael has done some really specific work that I think probably deserves discussion and exploration as well. So I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you Aparna, and um, thank you everyone for attending this session. It's really um, a pleasure to be asked to participate. Um, as Aparna was mentioning, the Internet Society has done a lot of work um, related to building uh, internet infrastructure and the economics of the development of internet infrastructure all along um, the distribution chain. So when it comes to uh, local access issues all the way through um, in, uh, IXPs um, and international uh, content or international bandwidth issues. Um, one of the things that we're increasingly looking at now is, is the other side of that puzzle, um, which is the demand drivers of local content. Um, so there's been a lot of focus, not just at ISOC, but in other places on building internet access infrastructure. And from the content side, there has been um, tra a traditional focus of looking at local content from a bit more of a cultural needs perspective and a cultural um, preservation perspective. Um, there's been a little bit less focus, however, on the development of local content industries and incentives for localization of content hosted overseas that is already created locally are aimed at local markets and hosted externally. So the content side of the equation is extremely important from the perspective of promoting the overall development of the internet, access development, and also affordability. Content obviously is what drives people to the internet. So it is a key part of that whole access ecosystem equation not just infrastructure itself, but also the information and the bits that are gonna fill the pipes to get people online, get businesses online, and get people to use the internet more effectively. So um, while access infrastructure and small scale um, cultural preservation content creation is important, uh, a greater focus on developing incentives and solutions for creating viable and thriving content industries from content creation to local hosting to sub-regional distribution is a key part of this puzzle, and it's a real pleasure to be on this panel to help look at these issues more um, in depth. Um, so what is the result of sort of really not looking at the content side more from um, an industry perspective? Um, the result is that there's a lot of access infrastructure that's been um, uh, put in place that may be underutilized, and um, the broader internet ecosystem in a lot of countries is underdeveloped because you're missing the industrial cultural side. Um, the other thing, too, is that there's a real big impact on um, jobs and the relationship um, with the local economy. Um, we know that there's a large base of digital skills already in place in many developing countries. So take, for example, Nollywood, which is Nigeria's Hollywood. They produce digitally over 200 videos or movies per month, primarily using digital technology, and it's an industry that's over about $250 million a year. 
Um, East Africa is a hotbed of innovation in web-based uh, applications and services, and digital development skills and uh, production skills are booming in places like North Africa, the Middle East, and of course in places like India and other places in Asia. So these content creators um, and industries really need to have the conditions to be able to host content locally, closer to their home markets, thereby making the access to their target audiences and their customers potentially quicker and cheaper, as well as the opportunity to host content internationally and serve like the lucrative diaspora markets, which is um, usually a source of very early monetization of local, uh, locally focused or culturally specific content. So um, I've used a couple examples from entertainment, but this also goes to other industries and supporting industries um, within the economy in general. So the export industry, banking, travel, a lot of what is being produced um, to support local industry is actually also hosted overseas because of the lack of um, uh, lack of uh, hosting facilities, because there's high costs and tariffs in order to be able to. Um, uh, get the infrastructure needed to actually host content locally, um, and other factors, power reliability, poor interconnectivity of networks, and cross-border connections. So there's really a lot at stake um, in looking at the broader side of content creation. So millions and looking out into the future, um, potentially billions in do, in, of dollars in jobs, uh, in new knowledge industry creation, and savings and access costs um, at large. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Michael Kende, who will um, give you a bit of an overview of some of the things that we've been looking at from the Internet Society side on one of the relationships between local infrastructure and local content in those opportunities. Um, but overall, I think the challenge for us all is to really, um, in addition to looking at the issue of uh, cultural preservation, of, of um, content and digitization of local cultural content, but also looking at local content from an industrial perspective and what needs to be done across the human, technical, and governance pieces of the puzzle in order to create incentives for local content industries to develop. Great, Michael. So if you could just highlight a couple of the key learnings and facts that you've worked on ISOC, worked on with and now at ISOC over the last couple of years, that would be great. I think Karen really touched on this relationship between infrastructure and content, and I know that's a sort of area of expertise for you, so elaborating on that more would be great. Great, thanks, and good morning. Um, yes, I want to elaborate a little on the point that Karen made about the local hosting and start with the observation. Um, so I've been doing a, a fair amount of work in, in Africa and other emerging regions, and one of the observations you can make is that um, all, all countries, these countries all have, have websites, have content, uh, typically the local newspapers, uh, radio stations might have their own websites, the hotels for getting business and others will have websites, um, but almost uniformly they're all hosted abroad, mostly in Europe. And it seems to me that the first step towards creating a content industry that's creating new content is creating an environment in which the existing content comes home and is hosted locally. Um, and that will start the ball rolling towards more people starting to create and, and put their content online. Um, so from a, re from a study I did um, for ISOC before joining, um, we looked at the benefit and impact of having an internet exchange point in a country, and we looked at uh, the exchange points in Kenya and Nigeria. And um, these are a critical first step towards hosting the content locally. So just for background, an IXP, an Internet Exchange Point, is a place where all the ISPs, the government, education, everyone can meet in the same room using the same switch to exchange traffic with one another locally and prevent having to send the traffic through a, a, another country to come back, typically Europe, for instance. A lot of African traffic goes through uh, London or different cities in Europe. A lot of Latin American traffic goes through Miami, probably 80% of it, I think. Um, 
So by bringing an IXP locally, allowing everyone to exchange traffic locally, it makes it very efficient to host content locally because with one connection to an ISP or one connection directly to the, to the IXP, you can get your traffic to all the eyeballs, to all the ISPs in the country. Um, and it'll be much quicker to access. The latency is much lower because you're not sending it tromboning around the world. Um, and you're lowering the cost because the ISPs don't have to pay to bring the content back from Europe or from, from Miami. They can access it locally on local circuits that are much cheaper uh, to, to operate. And um, Google actually provides a very good example of the benefits of an IXP. Google has a global cache um, initiative where they'll, they'll put their cache of YouTube and other static content um, that, that can be stored in a cache in country, um, typically then through one or more ISPs that connect to the local IXP and make the content available. And it demonstrates very clearly what the benefit of attaching to the IXP is because, as we saw in Kenya, the amount of traffic will triple almost overnight. Once you put in the cache locally, people who are getting frustrated downloading a video from abroad or um, because it just took too long or it timed out were suddenly starting to watch more video. And um, so they're watching a lot more video. The ISPs are selling a lot more megabits of traffic, so they're getting more revenues. So it really works out for everybody. They're saving costs. It's better for the consumers, and they're getting more revenue. So you'd think that this would lead to a lot more local hosting, having seen this example, but it doesn't seem to be the case. And I think that's just because an IXP is a necessary, but it's not sufficient to promote local hosting. And again, looking at Kenya, there's uh, plenty of data centers where you could put your traffic, put your cache, or put your uh, server directly, um, but they're not all full. We have a colleague uh, from the Internet Society, and he estimates that probably some of the some of the data centers are just a third full, that they have plenty of space, um, but they're not full, and everyone is hosting abroad. All the biggest uh, data, the biggest websites in Kenya are all hosted in Europe. So one reason for this is that, and this is kind of an economic explanation, but the reason for this is that the, the, if you're hosting content, it's cheaper to put it in Europe. There's more scale there, better power, big data centers. So you put your content there in Europe, you might save five, $600 a month um, by putting it abroad. Um, but you're actually imposing a huge cost on the ISPs because someone has to bring the content back. Every time a consumer wants it, it has to come back into the country, and the ISPs are paying for that. And at $120, $200 a megabit, you're imposing huge costs on the ISP. Um, so a solution should be available whereby everyone can save and the content can be delivered more efficiently by bringing it home. The ISPs would save a lot of money. There'd be more page views. Um, and you get overall benefits, and that's hard to, to, to come up with because there's two different players. The ISPs would like to save money by bringing it back, but the, the owners of the content are saving money by putting it abroad. So one solution that you see in a few countries, and I'll just talk about one. We can get into more discussion. I'm sure there's other ideas. But one solution that you see in some countries like South Africa is that um, there's differential pricing for accessing data. That is, that if you're using uh, a connection, all your local content is free. All international content is subject to data caps and pricing. So that means you have even more incentive to put your content locally because it'll be accessed much more because it's, it's free or much cheaper to download. And things like that can, can help to uh, adjust the pricing issue and hopefully bring more content back into the country. That'll build up scale, and that is... I think one of the, the best ways to kickstart the development of more content is to have the, the content that exists be, be brought home, as it were, back into the data centers in the country. Thanks, Michael. I think on this side of the table, what we're going to do is move up the sort of proverbial internet stack. Um, so Michael and Karen gave us some comments about the relationship between infrastructure and content. I'm going to ask Alice to talk a little bit about her experiences with Dot Africa, which is um, 
sort of an experiment in the uh, generic top level domain namespace and talk a little bit about the potential that GTLDs have to expand the local content universe. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Alice Munoz with the African Union Commission. Uh, that's uh, responsible of the sponsoring organization for a new generic top-level domain, uh, Dot Africa. Uh, it's a regional uh, top-level domain. Uh, now, just going uh, a little back to how uh, the, the process has been taking place, uh, I can introduce this new process to introduce new GTLDs around and launch the process in uh, between January and May 2012. Uh, the Africa region, having been the only one that actually didn't, doesn't have its own uh, top-level domain, also applied uh, for the geographic top-level domain dot Africa, and it's been sponsored by the African Union, having been given the mandate by African governments, the 54 African governments. Um, uh, this expansion, uh, ICANN expansion into new GTLDs, is expected to provide a new platform for cities, uh, geographic, uh, uh, and also internationalized domain names. Um, amongst people, uh, new strings, and they're intended to actually allow new top-level domain operators to create and provide m uh, more content in, in various languages and also in various scripts. Um, and this expansion is also going to allow businesses to identify themselves by sector or by their community. And for us, for the Dota Africa one, it's allowing uh, the African community and the African region to be able to identify or to have a, a digital presence, uh, an online presence uh, as, as the region. Um, ICANN has also, in the new GTLD process, has also introduced what they're calling an, uh, a rights protection mechanism uh, or what they're calling a trademark clearinghouse. Uh, and that is of particular concern to, uh, to the Africa region, to us in particular, because it hasn't really, um, uh, as I think as, as we all know, Africa is a continent that really hasn't um, had a strong presence online. Uh, and when it comes to uh, intellectual property, we still have quite a long way to go, and most of us are actually not engaged uh, with this process. And that, that's the reason why the African Union is actually through the, uh, the Dot Africa process trying to create our own local uh, approach to it, and we are calling it the Marx Validation System that's going to be engaging with African trademark holders and intellectual property rights um, uh, practitioners. Um, so for DOT Africa, the intention is to identify and elevate and enhance the, uh, Africa's digital presence, and then bringing the African continent together uh, under one umbrella to allow for all sorts of uh, activities from e-commerce uh, to technology and new infrastructure. Uh, to flourish, uh, the f and out of the the, the, the top-level domain, we are, um, uh, the, the African Union is going to be creating what they are calling a Dot Africa Foundation. That's going to be looking at coordinating ICT-related uh, activities, um, or, and out of out of uh, and it's it's going to be out of the surplus of managing the, the the TLD. And from this surplus, we are going to be engaging in capacity building and skills development activities. Uh, strengthening uh, African country code top-level domains. We all know that uh, the CCTLDs are an important part of the Internet's ecosystem and a, a place to build a strong local community and drive innovation. So that's one of the other uh, activities the, the Dot Africa Foundation is going to be looking at, including supporting the introduction of uh, internationalized domain names at, uh, at, uh, at that level, which will enable Internet users to access in their own language uh, generally, advancing multilingualism is another way of uh, ensuring uh, a robust and thriving internet that also provides uh, local content. In terms of content development, uh, we acknowledge Africa has a very rich and uh, cultural heritage and a base, but it also remains completely inaccessible uh, to most of the of the population. Uh, so we call it a content divide, and we are going to be looking at utilizing the Do uh, Dot Africa Foundation as an opportunity to pr promote that content development uh, by partnering with all with uh, content providers, social media vendors, governments. Uh, you know, we are already part of uh, the government as well as uh, uh, the community, um, and we we'll look at growing growing that through uh, providing a space for technology to grow by by, by supporting you know uh, lo local registrars we only have five uh, at the moment who are accredited to icon so it's expanding that base as well uh, and also uh, the idea of um, you know growing the level of multilingualism at, at that level so yeah thank you great thank you
Uh, turning over to Zahed, um, Zahed, we have talked at multiple times of, about sort of your experiences in being a part of the legal and policy ecosystem fostering local content development in Pakistan. And so I was hoping that you could sort of offer some high-level strategies based on your experience of what has worked and what hasn't worked in that space in recognizing that every region, country, area is different. But I think having a diversity of perspectives is really helpful. Thanks, Aparna. It's great to be here. Um, it's great to see that everybody's here at 9 a.m. in the morning. This is nearly a packed room. Um, so, I mean, we hear a lot about local, meaning you need to localize. If you want local content, you have to have local, you know, you got to have local infrastructure. You're going to have, so I come from a different perspective on this necessarily. Is the first step that you should build local infrastructure? Uh, is that the, the driver towards local content being developed? It can be. It is definitely helpful. And it's, it's a good thing for a country to have that local infrastructure. But I tend to think, and you know, forgive me, I'm a lawyer, uh, that an enabling environment or a regulatory environment that enables this is probably the soft side of it, in a sense. Or you know, lawyers might think the legislation is the hard side. But anyway, needs to be in place so that in especially developing countries, people are enabled by those policies to be able to develop this. So I'm going to talk about a little later about what the challenges we have with local hosting in practice in developing countries and, and you know, sort of focus on that in a minute. But you need to have uh, access to platforms internationally. That's my first headline. Um, you know, if I have a local hosting that's great, but I need to have access to Facebook, YouTube, Yahoo, everything I can possibly get my hands on so I can learn from it. I can understand how it functions, use it, and hopefully as a result, innovate and create my own content. A lot of times the in initial part of creating local content is by looking at what people have done in other countries and replicating that sometimes. The other part is then to say when you reach a certain level where you've been replicating or trying to sort of look at best practice, saying, all right, how do I make it more local? And you start innovating. That is what drives, I think. But to expect someone local to immediately innovate immediately without having that kind of access, I think is a, it can be a challenge. So what do I mean by regulatory environments? And I'll give you some examples that didn't work really well uh, where I'm from in Pakistan. Um, so, for instance, there was this element which decided to try and shut down Facebook. Facebook.com should be shut. There was a whole process of saying, well, there was a religious issue, and I'm in Indonesia. People remember the draw Muhammad Day as, an, as, as, a, as a Christ, etc. And the guys who went to court to say shut Facebook.com down were, interestingly enough, also the guys who had MuslimFacebook.com. And so they wanted a Pakistani Facebook to come up and arise as a result of that. Now, forgetting how they went about it and got the court order to try to do it and then launch that website, one would expect that should have thrived. That website, it's local content, local innovation. You block Facebook.com. This should just skyrocket through the roof. The answer is no, it didn't happen. In fact, that website completely failed. So even if you were going to try and sort of push other people up, you know, the, the, the internationalization of, of this, this process out and say, well, we're just going to use local content, it doesn't necessarily work. Similarly, another process took place. You have YouTube.com, which is even currently it's been blocked in, in Pakistan. So what happened to people who are developing content and uploading videos or linking this to their website and embedding this content? Trouble is, their websites, when they sort of put it up, they don't run YouTube. So people starting to sort of say, well, what's the point of me doing this? And so you're seeing less and less videos being uploaded or created for this purpose unless it can be hosted internationally. Now, who can get through to them? And we must remember, by these sort of, sort of regulatory regimes, have you been able to block that content of, of, of YouTube.com? No. Anybody who can get a VPN pretty much gets through. But guess what? There's a cost to it. And what that does is creates a digital divide. Because it's going to give you, take maybe a little more bandwidth, at least, at least, if not the cost of having a VPN unless you've got the free one running, then you've got these ads running on them, and then people saying there's a security issue with related to free VPNs. So what you're doing by these sort of situations is not enabling the local content, 
by saying, well, you know, you don't have a competitor from abroad, it's a big company, for instance, but you, you know, look at something local, why don't you develop a local platform? And it doesn't work because it kills the development of local content. The trouble is now, our government is actually embarrassed. It's, it's not sort of the, the, the great sort of uh, uh, being, you know, upset with, with Google or YouTube was, 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 has, has run, out, run its course. And now it's a question of, oops, how are we going to do this? How are we going to reopen it? With, and, and it's an embarrassing thing to do. So it, it, it sort of, you know, doesn't work. So I'd leave you with a thought as well, and I'm going to talk about hosting and why uh, local hosting can and can be, can or cannot be health necessarily, is that if you're going to try and have local content develop, think globally to have open global networks and access that is global so that it can have local relevance. So the content is local relevant content. But you need to have open access to global platforms. That is the most important thing. Because content does not equal hosting. Content is content. It can be on a hosting that is abroad or local. Now let me speak to you about, so say, we also heard about new GTLDs. And in the new GTLD space, it's, it's again a global process. And, and you need to be able to have open access to those. So what happens when you have local hosting? Well, we've, we've noticed, at least, where we are. Um, government servers will tend to, tend to run on local servers. The trouble you have is, number one, sometimes they are slow. Even though they are local, they tend to be slow. So guys who are trying to, people trying to access from abroad tend to find that it's, it's, there's a delay. So it has a reverse impact. People can't actually get through the government website, both locally and internationally. Secondly, it does actually cause a huge expense. Sometimes people would expect that because it's locally hosted, it will be cheaper. But what we found is because it's locally hosted, the companies tend to actually take a little more money, or at least the same amount of money. That does happen as well. Because they are actually trying to monetize the fact that you do not know how to do hosting abroad by yourself. So, okay, we got a guy who doesn't know how to do it. We'll charge him more. We'll get more money out of him. This tends to, uh, this tends to happen a bit. So, you know, it can actually impact efficiency sometimes as well. Now, I wouldn't say that hosting locally is a bad idea. I think it's a good thing. If that can, it can help infrastructure, it can help investment, it can help having efficient networks and infrastructure at home, it's a good thing. But it's very, very important not to say, in, in, at least in my view, that if you're going to have um, uh, content that is locally developed, you, the first thing you need to do is make sure you also have lo a locally hosted infrastructure. I think that's not necessarily the first thing you want to do. You want to make sure that the access to the networks are open, that people are able to learn and innovate. And that's my closing, but we'll, I'm, I hope for more questions. Thank you. Thanks, Ahed. I, I want to turn now to Bertrand for a bit of an overview. So we've talked a lot about local content, but I know that one of the things that Bertrand often talks about and thinks about is how we sort of take these local issues, cultural norms, et cetera, and translate them to an internet that is sort of fundamentally borderless. And so I wonder if you would talk just a little bit about the relationship between you know, niche, local, even niche content and how a borderless internet enables or does not enable that content to reach its audience. Thank you, Aparna. Apologies for having arrived a little bit, uh, a little bit late. Uh, preparatory breakfast for a workshop I have afterwards, exactly on this topic. So, by the way, if you're interested in internet and jurisdiction uh, cross-border issues, there's a workshop at 11 uh, on this. Actually, it's a very good thing to be at the end of the uh, uh, of the end of the line because it adds additional layers to the things that I had uh, prepared and, and thought about saying. I like very much what um, Zahid just, just introduced, the, the, the notion of, I wouldn't say the decoupling, but the relationship and the tension between local content and locally, and local infrastructure, to say uh, roughly. And actually, it's local content, local infrastructure, and local regulatory framework. It's an interesting triangle there. One thing that is, that is, that is clear, and um, as you said, uh, I'm running this project on the tension between the cross-border nature of the internet and the services that it has, and the patchwork of national jurisdictions. And one thing is absolutely obvious, and I, in that regard I would follow uh, what Zaid was saying, 
is that the existence of cross-border services, sort of infrastructural services in hosting, in cloud, in uh, platforms, uh, the best known being American platforms, but there are also platforms in other countries. There are very large platforms in China, there are some in Russia, and each of them is expanding in its own um, cultural uh, environment. It's interesting to see that in a certain way, you see digital territories emerging where, whereby people will share a certain type of um, script or a certain type of cultural environment are, are sharing cross-border platforms. It's not only the international uh, Western-based platforms. But one thing that is very important is that the existence of those uh, services, which are a sort of software infrastructure, if you want to what I mean. It's, it's the distinction between having the hardware hosting centers and the pipes and the infrastructure for telecommunications. And at the other layer, there's a sort of software infrastructure layer, which is those platforms. And the existence of those platforms has indeed produced fascinating effects in terms of lowering the barrier to entry for the distribution of content. Because when we talk about content, there are many things behind the term content. We, we have tended, and, and I'm a little bit sad that this is the direction that it has taken, now when we're talking about content, we tend to see, think in terms of the general intellectual property debate. It's, it's content like entertainment content. That's not what we're talking about here only. It's also everything that people are posting on, on their own, like um, the things that they post on blogs. It can be thoughts. It can be things on, on a Pinterest or any other equivalent uh, platform. Uh, of course, what they post on social media uh, platforms. And the reason why it is a leverage for, for people individually is that it provides a distribution channel. The beauty of the digital era, it has nothing to do with which platform you're using, the beauty of the digital era is to lower considerably the cost of distribution, as <laughs> the music industry, unfortunately for them, knows pretty well. Um, the replication uh, mechanism, think about it, especially when you're talking about a diaspora. But again, when we're talking about local, it's not necessarily local, local physically. It can be a subset of people. I mean, we're in Asia, in, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in a certain number of countries, there is a huge diaspora. Through social media platforms and other modes of distribution of interaction, they're keeping in touch with people who are thousands of miles away. Is what you're posting on a social media platform local content? You bet it is. It is something that is about the individual life of people. It's about what they think is happening in their country. It's about what they think should happen in their country. It's a lot of things. And so the question is not so much that it is, the equation is local content, i.e. locally hosted, i.e. locally produced and so on, it's much more distributed than that. Furthermore, there is a whole ecosystem around this. For everything to work well at the local level, you need to have the alignment of the creators, whatever the content is, the services, hosting platform in terms of the software layer, the hosting platforms in terms of the hardware infrastructure, the legal environment that allows you to post something or not to post something, but also the underlying infrastructure in terms of power reliability and so on. And as was said before, we are in this paradoxical situation where international content may actually be cached locally to facilitate access in a content distribution network, where meanwhile, very locally produced content to increase accessibility to a diaspora or else may be hosted in another country. The challenge the, though is the, what was mentioned earlier. There is a connection between the transmission costs, the hosting costs, and the distribution of value along the chain. 
loca locating the hosting of content in one country is connected to how much it would cost also to make the back and forth through the uh, transmission lines to a hosting system in another uh, region. And so, as in many cases, these issues are interconnected and can only be really addressed in taking the different dimensions and giving the actors around the table who address the different pieces. And finally, as you heard, I'm, I'm directing this internet and jurisdiction issue. One of the big challenges is the compatibility of the norms regarding content in different countries. What is legal in one can be illegal in another. And one of the big challenges, we can develop further, but one of the very big challenges is what is the international regime that applies to content that is developed in one place and may be perceived as illegal in another place? And we're talking about local content. I'm sorry, local content development is not only a question that regards the regions where there is less content that is being produced currently. That's one part of the issue. But there is a big question regarding what is produced in some countries, freedom of expression in one country that is considered as illegal or offensive in another country. And here I'm not even talking about religious or other things like that. It's a tension between the United States and France, for instance. I'm French. There is a tension regarding the norms regarding anti-Semitism and hate speech. And part of the things that we're trying to address in the Internet and Jurisdiction Project is what we, we call the question of digital coexistence, i.e. on shared online spaces. Because what we're talking about is shared online spaces. How do you manage the coexistence of different individual and legal norms? We have a challenge because if we don't find a solution to address those issues of potential tension, then the tensions will arise in the physical world and the whole question of the creation of content is putting people in contact with other people who have completely different framework and before they were not particularly in contact. It's a great thing, it's wonderful, it's absolutely beautiful. However, it is creating new types of issues and it's important that we understand that there is an ecosystem of actors at the economic level that contains both the ISPs, the ISPs, the content producers, the hosting platforms, the physical hosting platforms, and the software hosting platforms, but that there is also an ecosystem of um, interoperability framework between the producers of content, the platforms that host this content across borders, and the legal environments in which each of them operate. Thank you. Thanks, Bertrand. So we've covered actually quite a lot of ground, um, local content, content distribution costs, local ho hosting and infrastructure, regulatory frameworks, both local and international, and we've touched on a lot of sort of areas of expertise, whether they're technologically technological solutions or, uh, you know, infrastructure frameworks. We've touched on some economic issues. Um, Bertrand has mentioned sort of broader legal considerations and social norms. So it's a lot of ground. I want to turn it over to you all for questions. I have some of my own if you are feeling shy, but it doesn't appear to be that way. Is there another? Um, Mariam Abulfazi, Eurasia Foundation, thank you very much. I really, um, I learned a lot through that discussion and it was, I'm glad that all of them were short and sweet so it was easy to follow. Um, I have a question that nobody spoke about and, and maybe that's because this, there's so many other things to discuss um, which I had never considered. Uh, but one thing that I struggle with is language. 
Um, and I don't know if any of you all deal with that. So I'm more sort of obsessed with the actual content part um, rather than I haven't thought about a lot of the infrastructure um, and legal issues that we're talking about, though, I, though uh, since I work a lot in the Middle East, North Africa, I do think about the filtering a lot. So I was just wondering if any of you had encountered this language issue um, and how you've dealt with it. Um, primarily, I'm talking about how um, a lot of uh, populations don't are not comfortable in English, maybe aren't literate in English, and, and access to the Internet is therefore... Uh, blocked to them in that way, and as they've tried to develop local language content, come into technological or other uh, struggles. That's of interest to me. Uh, it's a very important question. A few quick points. I'll make an analogy. If you live in a small town, you have a few shops, and they tend to be relatively general. You get a fashion shop, but you don't have 200, or you get an antique shop, and that's all. If you live in a large metropolis with millions of people, you have a much bigger specialization. So you'll get somebody who's, for instance, specialized in antique brooches from the 20th century early stages Art Deco style. Why? Because there's a market available. Why is it connected to your question? Because language diasporas or language groups can be distributed geographically and now reach a critical mass in terms of outreach that they couldn't uh, in the past. You couldn't have, for instance, the capacity to print a newspaper when your language community is spread in very different geographical locations. With digital space, you do have this. Meanwhile, the challenge, and I'm French, so I know the problem from the inside, although I'm not an endangered language, <laughs> It is always the challenge between whether you want to address your own community or reach out to a global, more global audience. The fact that some languages are gateways to a more global audience is a fact of life. And you see in the scientific community, whether we like it or not, that publishing in English is a necessary step. That being said, there are more and more translation tools in one way or the other. So the language issue is both going in one direction, which is the capacity to have more um, reach for s less frequent languages, which means that they are likely to survive more. But on the other hand, there is a, uh, a concentration in some, in some zones. The second point quickly that I want to address is in the new GTLD space, the introduction of IDNs is something that I have pushed very f much when I was in the governmental advisory committee as a, as a vice chair because it is very important to give this differentiation. That being said, when I went to a Russian IGF in Moscow two years ago, and I was given business cards that were all written in Cyrillic, and the only thing that I could read was the actual email address in Latin character, I suddenly realized what I had enabled, that the next step will be the business cards entirely in Cyrillic, and the email address will be in something that I cannot address on my keyboard. So it's a very interesting challenge that we are both enabling diversity, but at the same time, it may be introducing new separations. And I would even go one step further. I'm on the ICANN board. When we think about what kind of top-level domains are going to be accepted in the future rounds in the different scripts, there may very well be different positions by the governmental advisory committee whether a word is acceptable written in Arabic or not acceptable written in Latin characters, which means that little by little we might see the emergence of a very interesting but dual-edged phenomenon, which is what I call the emergence of script plates, i.e. where the rules for the domain names in Cyrillic might become slightly different from the rules for the domain names in Latin characters. I don't know. So the language issue is becoming a very interesting structuring factor that is not related just to the physical uh, space, but the cyberspace is going to be structured, I believe, more and more around script spaces, and the interfacing between both is a very interesting issue. Alice, do you want to add a couple of thoughts? 
Um, I think Bertrand has said everything. <laughs> Uh, but uh, coming from a country that has over 45 languages, a continent that probably has over a thousand languages, uh, the, the issue of language is very, very, very important. Uh, and not, not the, the, the least that the fact that Africa is also divided. We have Francophone Africa, Lusophone Africa, and Anglophone Africa. So there's always uh, an issue there, not just at the, at the local level, but also um, you know, at the governmental level when we're discussing issues at civil society. Uh, it's, it's, it's a sticky issue. It's an issue that, um, that, that, that's extremely important and that we are always having to think about all the time. Uh, having said that, though, um, uh, you know, act, you know, ac and acknowledging that it's that important, uh, one of the things that most governments are trying to do and to, to assist in this is to create that environment that, like Zahid had spoken about earlier, in terms of a policy and regulatory environment that allows, that begins to take into consideration some of the long local languages as official languages, uh, and ensuring that um, there is space uh, in, in, you know, both at the digital level and, you know, at, you know, uh, in the way that content is, is, is presented and provided uh, and even packaged uh, that allows for all the local communities to be able to access it because you know, local content is only local if it's relevant uh, and, and in, in a language that can be understood by uh, the people that are using it. Uh, but also uh, we are seeing an, inc an increase of um, more internet users, for example, in Kenya, beginning to actually localize you know, content in, you know, uh, developing content that is local in, key, in our own local languages so that they are able to speak to uh, emerging users uh, and, and that it's, you know, in a, in a, in a more relevant way. Uh, and, and then an important issue is obviously the internationalized domain names and um, that, that's actually going to be uh, quite an, an important one, especially for, for the Dot Africa TLD as well. Uh, ensuring that we are availing that uh, at that level for you know for governments and for all the other users, uh, so an important, a very important issue and one that uh, you know we are taking into consideration. Too. Just two very quick, two two quick points. Uh, you know, why global is actually local? Um, I'll give you an example from Pakistan. We are you know 180 million, say 200 million people. Uh, we have a national language called Urdu. Uh, we have a script that is unique to us. Uh, it's the Urdu script. Guess what? We're not in the Unicode. What does that mean? That means the Urdu script, the national script, doesn't exist in the Unicode. And the, the, the issue is why? Because we haven't had engagement from our community to go globally and try to make that happen. So the, can you explain for folks who don't oh, know sorry. what the Unicode is? Okay. Uh, so, so, Okay, now that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> you brought so it all, up. <laughs> my fault. I brought that up. Okay, um, most of the scripts or, or letters that you that you use in a computer, I'm going to try to make it as basic as possible, are on a table, a big table of many pages. And if you want to use a specific script, whether it's in uh, the Latin, as we say, in English sort of characters, or ASCII characters, or if it's in Arabic character or Chinese character, it needs to be in this table, this book, this big book. And so the thing is, if it's not there, you can't use it on, uh, on the internet or through your computer. So if, if my script, which is Urdu, doesn't exist in there, I can actually even type in my content. So guess what we had to do? Talk about innovation. We're using Farsi. We're using Farsi for that to be able to type Urdu. The funny bit is that we have a small, well, small, well, smaller province called Sindh. It has a totally different script. Its script is in the Unicode because those local community people went globally and said, our script is important. We want this in the Unicode. But the government of Pakistan hasn't been able to do a thing about getting its own script in, which is the national official language. Kind of a reverse situation, so just one, that was one point. Second, think about the issue of uh, if we're going to take content locally to developing countries particularly, it's one thing to have it enabled in the system. So, you know, you have the Unicode, you can have IDNs and all these things work. But also think about are they going to be using mobile devices? And if they're going to be using mobile devices, that's the input the process by which you put the, uh, the, the input goes. I'm sorry, oh, I'm getting all confused here. And does the keypad have that local character on it. So again, unless the manufacturer develops that with the local character, you have this in Arabic, for instance, in other languages, it'll be difficult for people to be able to actually use it as well. So that's another thing to think about. That's why I think it's, again, I come back, global access, global impact causes local relevance. Thank you.
Okay, next question. Hi, Mike Jensen from South Africa. I wanted to thank Bernard from bringing up the, for bringing up the uh, ecosystem approach to this because I think that that is really relevant. You have to have all the pieces in the puzzle uh, working together for local content to be developed. And building on that, I think, uh, for me, still the biggest barrier to local content development in developing countries is the high cost of access. Uh, on average, this is about 50% of, a, of the average developing country's uh, income compared to about 2% in Europe. So at that high cost, you're just not going to see local content developed on a broad scale uh, and, the, and the masses of people to be able to participate in these systems. And I think that comes back down to the local infrastructure issue. It's not really a matter of, of uh, content hosting. Of course, that's part of the equation, but it's the provision of access for the end user. And uh, I think part of the problem there is the focus on mobile broadband, which is obviously a lot more of an expensive solution, and it has other impacts on local content development. Um, people with a tiny little interface on their phone are not going to do much more than hit like or dislike or whatever, uh, as opposed to actually putting relevant content on the net. And also what we're seeing now is this kind of reverse net neutrality issue coming up because we're seeing a few sites being made available for free, such as Facebook or Wikipedia, on this mobile platforms. So people think, ah, we've got the internet. But all they've got is this little walled garden. And what it also means is that they don't get exposed to other local content sites. All they see is Facebook and Wikipedia. And so none of the, the small... Uh, in emerging Facebooks or Wikipedias get seen by these people uh, because they're just not visible on their platforms. Thank you. So maybe in line with that, Michael or Karen, could you talk a little bit about sort of how, what are the sort of strategies to bring down the cost of access more generally, speaking to this more general relationship between content and access? Well, I mean that that's an excellent question, and, and a lot of a lot of work has gone into that, um, and there's a lot of different answers, parts of the puzzle. Uh, in some countries, there's very high taxes on handsets. There's not enough spectrum, so it's quite scarce. Um, you have um, significant costs for accessing rights of way to connect uh, to the to the gateways, international connectivity is very expensive. So there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle and there's been a lot of work on that to try and drive that down. Um, we, uh, the Internet Society is one of the sponsors of the new um, Alliance for Affordable Internet that is trying to help meet the Broadband Commission goals of getting the cost, uh, I think it's under 5% of annual income for, for broadband. Um, so I think that's a space to watch, and, and they'll be going, I think, picking three or four countries to start looking at to try and see how, what the best practices are for driving down costs, and the other part of that is to get up to 40% of the population connected. So I think there's a lot of initiatives there um, that will take care of that. Um, and, but one of the pieces of the puzzle is whatever the costs are, it's got to be cheaper if the content can be can be hosted locally, um, but just because that adds a huge part of the cost, if you're paying two hundred, three hundred dollars per megabit to access content from abroad, anything you can do, whatever the cost of access is, the other parts, anything you can do to take that piece out, uh, has to help uh, to to drive down the costs. Thanks, and I just wanted to um, make a bit of a comment related to what Michael was saying and, and what Zahid was saying as well. Um, ISOC participated with UNESCO and the OECD in the study on relationships between infrastructure and content, and one of the things that was brought up is that one of the key drivers um, for um, the local content ecosystem is actually access to international connectivity and international bandwidth. Um, so this key about ensuring that open global access is important um, is, is a key piece of this. It is an ecosystem, and there needs to be multiple opportunities available 
for people either to reach uh, uh, audiences internationally, to be able to host things more locally. Um, the key is to put the incentives in place for people to have more choice about the content that they create, the audiences that they're trying to reach, and where that content can be accessed most cost efficiently and effectively. So these are all related issues. Indeed, it's an ecosystem. Um, in general, we, we kind of tend to think of, of three very broad buckets, which is the, the technical uh, infrastructure, the human infrastructure, and the governance infrastructure. So um, all of these are real, really three key related pieces. When you're talking about um, access infrastructure in general, whether you're talking about content, and the key relationship between the two, content as a demand driver for, uh, for local access. And I also take the point of what Mike um, Jensen said as well, is I think we are um, selling a lot of the world short when we say that it is sufficient for um, individuals and users to only access content on things like small screens and mobile phones when, you know, uh, maybe what you can do is sort of press, you know, like and, and type, in a few, uh, type in a few words. Um, at the same time, um, in looking at internationalization and international languages, one thing, and this is also has a real impact on the access side of the equation and bandwidth, um, is the use of, of audio and video for content. The ab availability and ability to make a short video and post that online in a local language. Um, the ability to you know, make an audio file, put your music online. Um, these are, these are you know, not inherently text-based. They are high bandwidth drivers. Um, so this is all part of the ecosystem as well. And, and one final comment, I mean, one question is what is local content, yeah. right? What is it? Yeah. How do we grapple with it? I think that the, still the highest, um, the highest number of page views on YouTube is still size Gangman style video. I think it is, when we just look that up. Right, um, you know, like that's in Korean. I mean, I think it was locally put on YouTube to sort of reach the Korean market, but I mean, it's local content to me because we play it at weddings all the time in the U.S. and everybody's dancing. <laughs> so, you know, and it's in Korean, and, you know, but to me, it's, it's local content. Um, so one of the questions is, is what does really local content mean? Maybe we're getting a little bit cryptic in the discussion, but this is obviously a very rich um, issue um, with a lot of interesting angles when we take an ecosystem perspective. Thanks. I know Zahid had uh, something to add, and then I want to actually turn. <laughs> Sorry. Just give us a second. Okay. Um, I want to turn to Alice to touch on a couple threads that have gone through the discussion so far. So go ahead, Zahid. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Yeah, Karen, excellent points. Must say, they're absolutely right. And the videos, et cetera, as we said, are extremely important. I just want to also, and I want to take this opportunity to say something which is slightly related um, with, the, with the enabling environment. Uh, we think that Wicked is over. Many people might, that, you know, it's done, it's whatever. But let me tell you on the ground, and this is related to the question that was raised, the Wicked, the Wicked, yeah, the Wicked, which is the, the, the convention that led to sort of, you know, two sides of the world effectively saying, we follow this or not, is actually happening on the ground right now. So in my country, for instance, we're seeing a reversal of the telecom liberalization that took place, for instance, in the 2000s. We're seeing monopolies being created. We're seeing fewer telecom operators. We're seeing fewer licenses. We're seeing a coming together of certain developing country or south to south cooperations going in leveraging their relationships with the government and saying, can we actually close down on this infrastructure a little more? Can we be fewer players so we can help you more to filter? Can we help you more to do certain things which are not necessarily going to give us the open access, for instance? So at the Salat, came into my country, took over the telecom infrastructure. Now, effectively, from 250, ISPs were down to literally one or two. That's it. And one of the things they're not letting happen at the moment is get the 3G auction off the ground. So the point I wanted to make was 
we are seeing, on a globe, at least in some developing countries, a reversal of the liberalization that took place that got us all of the stuff we're using right now. And maybe one of the things we want to focus on, on a very high level, is how do we get back that liberalization stream? Because we, you know, we, we, the WTO did a fantastic job with its, with its gas, et cetera, to open it up. But we're seeing a reversal, and that directly impacts many of the things we're talking about. So at this point, I want to just sort of tie together a couple different that threads. Um, Zahid, you sort of mentioned this, what do we need to do to shift norms to get back to a place of liberalization and competition? Alice, I know you talked a little bit about capacity building and the work that Dot Africa Foundation is doing. And Karen, you mentioned the importance of not only technical infrastructure, but human infrastructure. And so because you are doing some capacity building through Dot Africa, what I wanted to ask you, Alice, is what are sort of the key human capacity building initiatives that we need to pursue if we really want to foster a vibrant content, local content ecosystem? Uh, uh, thank you, and, that, and that's extremely important. Um, and I think all stakeholders here have a role. Uh, so I'm not just speaking uh, here you know, for African governments and, and uh, the role they have to play in uh, fostering innovation and creating that innovative environment for cotton creation. Uh, but for all you know, stakeholders, uh, for example, from a dot Africa perspective, our expectation is that uh, for African governments and through the African Union is having created that environment, uh, provided that environment for just the, the TLD itself to, to, to have been applied for and uh, provided that political support uh, at, at the national and regional level. Uh, but also um, taking it seriously in terms of beginning to look at, for example, one mechanism we are calling the reserve name list and looking at that specifically and connecting that actually to uh, local relevant content and reserving names that, that eventually might be used uh, for all sorts of things, for example, for tourism, for education, uh, you know, um, you know, for you know, data, data creation. Even governments, um, most of the governments, are coming up with the the, the open data initiative to just ensure that uh, public health uh, data is made available in in various languages and in, di in digital format. Um, for you know, for register for the business community is supporting the growth of the domain name sector in the Africa region. We don't have that. And we don't have that for the various reasons that have been presented before. You know the, you know the digital divide, the content divide, the expensive access, the the lack of access to infrastructure, uh, and for as long as we have a very nascent and very young uh, internet uh, community and internet industry, it's going to take a while uh, for uh, for for example the domain name sector industry to also grow and for local content to uh, to to be created. Um, and, and also, um, it's also utilizing the opportunities that come up uh, in terms of uh, international collaboration, not just, uh, you know, there's a level at which, you know, the expectation is that local governments will do have to do their work, and so is local businesses, but also at the, at the international level, uh, that collaboration is very important. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Karen, is there something you would want to add and then Bertrand? On hum human capacity building? Uh, okay. Yeah, and I think there's also, again, and I gave a few examples of um, sort of key core skills in adjacent industries um, that we see in a lot of countries that um, are likely readily adaptable to the creation of uh, uh, internet content. Um, you know, again, taking the example of the very developed digital film industries in a lot of regions around the world, whether it is um, Nigeria, which has an audience across all of Africa and a very large diaspora. I mean, I, I can't tell you um, how many Nigerian soap operas I actually follow on a regular basis. Um, and... Um, you know, India, elsewhere, uh, you know, um, um, journalism, the ability for people to, um, to sort of tell stories as well um, in, in terms of 
of uh, their voice, views, perspectives, and, and point of view. So, um, you know, one of the questions I think also from a government perspective in terms of fostering local content skills and industries is what kind of adjacent industries can we look at to say yes that are really key adjacent skill sets here um, that we can incentivize into looking at um, putting more content online either that they're already creating or applying their skills to an online industry um, as well as key skills to keep infrastructure running as well. Um, uh, as Zahid was saying, um, in terms of sometimes hosting locally can be a lot less reliable than hosting internationally. Um, and there are, beyond sort of skill sets involved, there's, there's other issues with, you know, power and connectivity and efficiency. But there is a real need to ensure that um, the human infrastructure is in place in order to be able to support the development of content, whether it's hosted internationally, whether people host it locally, and to really kickstart um, the knowledge economies in some of these areas. Yeah, I'd, li I'd like to come back to a few points that have been, that have been made. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I participate in panels, I always try to, to pick on something that I didn't visualize as as an angle or a way to, to, to highlight a, an issue. The connection that was made earlier between video, local content, the question of literacy, the fact that video is actually something that broadens the capacity of people to access local content because there's not the filter of literacy, is directly connected to the fact that video is a high bandwidth thing and directly connected to the fact that it's consumed on mobile and that the mobile broadband network is a key component for the capacity to produce because the mobile phone and the smartphones may be small, but for videos, they are the instrument that produces the immediate feedback loop. I'll give you a very concrete example. We had a photographer for our booth yesterday in our sessions. This guy has a camera that automatically streams the pictures that are being taken immediately to his mobile phone so that he can edit them and, and collect them. And this is seamless. It's seamless. Why? Because there's the data network that is enabling this thing. So the connection and the importance of mobile broadband is absolutely fundamental, whether it connects a small phone or a larger tablet. The second thing, if I may, that I wanted to, to highlight is to... Uh, continue on the key question that was underlying, which is, what is local content? There are many things. I don't want to get into detail, but I want to highlight one thing that came to mind when the question about language was asked. What is the legal regime for spontaneous, non-for-profit translation of IP-protected content in another language? You get content that will never, ever, ever, ever be translated in small community languages. There's no market. It costs a tremendous amount to do this, and it will never be recouped. If you want to translate this, you need to negotiate today an extensive agreement, and it costs time and money to negotiate this contract. The owner of the rights has no interest, and it's perfectly legitimate that it has no interest to get into the process of negotiating the rights to translate in a very small uh, language. The capacity of somebody who speaks this language and is fascinated by this content, it can be a, a professional document or it can be even a novel, to translate it in the local language as a labor of love is perfectly possible. Problem is it's illegal. And there is a key question regarding availability in local languages of content that is published in another language. I cannot read Japanese. I'm so happy that there is a translation in French of Japanese novels. But if I only speak a local language, I will never have access to a Japanese uh, novel or so because there's no publisher that is going to publish this in, in, in this local language. So the right to translate is a very interesting topic. And finally, picking on, on what Zahid was saying, yes, there is a trend backwards. The, unfortunately, on many other issues, the NSA and uh, Snowden thing is bringing a data sovereignty type of thing, the relocalization of everything and reimposing borders. 
the challenge is not only to uh, prevent this, this trend towards re-bordering the thing. We need to go beyond liberalization. Liberalization is not enough, it's a basis. We need synchronization. When we have an ecosystem, this is the fundamental rationale behind the multi-stakeholder approach. You need the actors in the room so that in an ecosystem where things are interconnected, they can synchronize, meaning that they each do their own thing, but they know what the others are doing. I see a question in the audience. Thank you very much for a really interesting uh, discussion. I'm learning quite a bit. Uh, my name is Mehri Karegdeva, and I'm here um, on behalf of Beyond Access. Um, I just wanted to bring the conversation back to uh, cost effectiveness uh, and cheap ways of developing a local content. In a lot of countries, local content is being developed by some of the institutions, such as libraries, that maybe don't realize that they're contributing to the local content. But libraries are often left out from the conversation about the local content development. And I was wondering, um, there are 230,000 public libraries exist in developing and transitioning countries. What are the ways we could bring them to the table um, when we're talking about the local content development? Thank you very much. How do you think on, on you know, my feet, basically? I think uh, we had something at the last IGF, and we had somebody from um, the International Libraries Association. I'm not sure there's an, there's, a, there's an organization. And they were talking about how important it was and how they were changing their model that it wasn't just they were providing uh, books as a library, but they were providing a space to people to be able to meet in those local libraries and giving them access to high quality bandwidth internet and access. So I think one of the, the most useful things that libraries can do is be again the community center in that respect. Be the place where you, if you want high quality bandwidth, that's where you go. Not, I'm not just saying convert them in a cyber cafe alone, but we're saying that they can play an extremely good role. And that's the relationship they will have with the ecosystem of having that contract or that network negotiation, et cetera. So they could actually provide in some senses, uh, again, I'm very careful not to say cafes for internet cafes, but, but a, a location where you could do this. So I think that's where they would fit in very, very well. But they also would have an intellectual uh, aspect around it. They could help people then teach them or let other people who are in the room there teach each other how to actually develop content in, in, in those spaces. So I think they have a critical role. They can be brought into the sphere in, in, that, in that way. Yeah, I, I think it's really useful to think of um, um, places like libraries, um, even universities, um, the content the government creates, um, to put them in the category of, of what I call bit generators, right? They're creating digital content, they're creating bits, just like newspapers create bits, um, entertainment industries, they create content. So I think when you look at it from that perspective, you really um, sort of see the power of whether it is libraries, whether it is government content online, whether it is universities putting content online to contribute to um, sort of the data ecosystem in a country. And in that perspective, um, one of the things that we promote really heavily when we talk about internet exchange points is not just to focus internet exchange points on putting ISPs together to exchange content or to, ex to exchange data. You need that other part. You need the content side of the equation. So just as a, 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 a content hosting facility would get value out of participating at an IXP, we need to go to the places like universities, to things like libraries, to government networks, to get them to connect to things like IXPs because they do provide that demand driver of content. They are bit generators like others and a key part of the ecosystem and one that's often underlooked. I'll just add one other comment there, which is we've done a lot of thinking at Google about how you really drive high bandwidth infrastructure. And one of our sort of longstanding beliefs has always been that you really need to bring 
big bandwidth to community institutions like libraries, like universities, because those are, even in the developed world, one of the places where a broad swath of the community can experience online content, generate content, be part of a community in which learning to produce content is a, is a key factor. So I think it's important both, it, it's obviously important in the developing world, but I, I think it's equally important uh, across the globe. Other questions? Oh, yeah. Hello, my name is Wendy Rocket. Um, I work for Books for Asia, which, which is the access to information arm of um, the Asia Foundation. I'm also here with Beyond Access. Um, traditionally, Books for Asia has worked with um, publishers um, to improve access to information. And of course, we, uh, we see the huge potential of internet and digital um, information to, to, for that same aim. Um, and I was just wondering, what we found um, working in developing Asia is that um, for, for many countries, it's still largely a print-based society. And um, for a variety of reasons, traditional content producers are not putting their content online. So I'm just wondering if any of you have worked um, directly with content producers in developing countries or seen examples of um, ways to encourage traditional content producers to put their content online. Um, a very sort of local uh, example. Um, a lot of our poetry, which is sort of semi-Farsi, but it's in Urdu, it has a rich heritage, um, isn't available online. So one of, one of the things we did was uh, CCTLD tried to sort of speak to as many people uh, in the community, go to folks. And, 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 and coming from our region, obviously, in our country, those guys aren't making a lot of money because in that developing country, they're not getting royalties. They're not getting much money back for having produced that content anyway. So when you go and approach them and say, we would like to put it on the web, they're really happy that it's there so people can read it. So it revives itself. And it gives it again, you know, that life comes into it again. And so we, we, we've been trying to sort of reach out to those authors and writers and somehow to try and get them to sort of, you know, want, to, you know let us have the content online. So we've been doing, that. that's one example. And I think that, that has been helpful. And it's interesting because uh, some of that stuff that's being done is not just talk, well the authorization is local at times. Some of them have gone to Canada or elsewhere. Get you have to contact them, but a lot of the development of it can also be done in a crowdsourcing way. Like you know, can we get the poetry together? So it it tends to be also global in the way you put it together. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention here is it is absolutely right. Getting archives, so you know, content creators such as newspapers. And being able to go in and say, guys, could you know, do you think you want to get online? Do you want to, you know, make this available? Is a challenge, and it takes a huge amount of effort. Uh, getting our legal um, um, uh, digests was a fight. I mean, that the the publishers just didn't want to do it. Somebody just scanned it. Eventually, just came online. And slowly we're starting to, you know, it, it start, when they realize, oh my goodness, I can just sit back at home and I get a check at the end of the day from these users, maybe that's a way to do it. So you need to try and figure out a monetization method as well for them. So for different people, different things. For authors who want, you know, to revive their, 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 their name, et cetera, go to them and talk with them about that. Some publishers will be enticed by money, but you need to make that, that value proposition. And a third one, you know, government also produces uh, content. And we, uh, in the last uh, year and a half, actually, took our National Assembly debates, which are not accessible or available anywhere. Most of them have been destroyed or lost or just, you, you can't get them print, printed anymore, and scanned whatever we could. And we're about to put it online. So that, that's, a, that's a different aspect of it. But you need to find volunteers who'd probably want to do something like that. Thanks. I think one question to ask publishers is what industry do they think they're in? Are they in the industry of putting letters on paper and distributing paper with text? Or are they in the information distribution business? 
which sort of op which should open their thinking to different channels of distribution. Um, and I'll give you a really good example of one com company that got this question really wrong, um, which was Encyclopedia Britannica <laughs> in the United States. So Encyclopedia Britannica, um, you know, in, in the dawn of sort of the internet and in the computer age, um, you know, still insisted that their business model of printing encyclopedias and going door to door and, and selling actual physical books, that was the business they were in, in printing books and having those physically distributed. They really didn't see what industry they were in, which was the distribution of information and content and what happened. Um, Bill Gates and uh, Encarta uh, put a much sort of uh, a cheaper and, and less quality, I would say, in terms of, uh, of the content version um, uh, on CD-ROMs um, and distributed those as part of the Microsoft package and, and operating systems. And this was really before sort of the internet was a, as big of a, um, a distribution channel as it is now. But the bottom line is that the Encyclopedia Britannica had their industry completely gutted because they were looking at their industry in the wrong way. So I think w one possible way is to challenge these companies to think about what industry they're really in um, and looking at um, uh, other distribution channels for um, content uh, beyond just physical uh, books and uh, text on paper. If I may piggyback on that, uh, it's a very good way to pose the question. At the same time, the problem is that there is no industry now for encyclopedia. So it's not a migration from an industry to another industry. It's a migration from what was an industry to something that is now a crowdsourced Wikipedia uh, environment. So there was no migration path for them in terms of making a business. And one of the, one of the challenges is the monetization track. Um, Zahid was making a very interesting distinction between the publishers and the authors. Because the publishers have been in the distribution business in basically the selection and distribution channel management, whereas the authors have always desired to have as much exposure as possible. And the two do not go together because the author is willing usually to have a lot of exposure even for free, whereas the distribution packager is managing scarcity in terms of the shelf space and things like that. And the disappearance of scarcity of shelf space and the lowering cost of replication has changed the business model of the distributors. I agree with that. The problem is that people have talked too much about disintermediation. Uh, they should be talking about reintermediation. And today there is a reintermediation. The question that I will not open is the, the chain of value, particularly regarding individual producers. How do you find a way to make a living by producing content? Uh, that is distributed online, and this hasn't been. Uh, this is not that hasn't been cracked completely yet, but it's the right way to ask the question. I agree. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Hi, I'm uh, Braxton Perkins from NBC Universal. Just following on the point Bertrand made talking about supporting local content development, we've talked about cost side. But on the point you just made, uh, for local content, are we talking about creating revenue opportunities, not just for local authors, but also for local publishers? How critical is it in the ecosystem that there are lo locality issues with both the publishers as well as the authors? A, a very quick answer regarding what do we mean today by publisher? I give you a very concrete uh, element. In the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, we have a newsletter every, every month. I mean, it's not sold, whatever. But we are somehow a publisher. The way it is being done is through a, an observatory of 20 scholars that are in different universities who, through appropriate tools, crowdsource cases in the news, in the media, and crowd rank every month 20 cases. Are we a publisher? Yes, in a certain way we are a publisher. 
But this is completely different from the job that publishers are doing in the physical traditional environment where they actually print something and so on. What is the function of publisher? I would argue that the real function of a publisher is value adding, that it is supposed to be identifying good content, helping this content improve, and putting it through the right channels for distribution. It's an intermediary. This new function of publishing is completely changing. And um, how the chains of distribution and re-intermediation are going to make money circulate from one end to the other is a, a very uh, open question. And here again, we are in an ecosystem discussion. And I'm frustrated on a personal basis to see that this discussion is being handled, call it net neutrality, call it distribution on the value chain, whatever, in a way that is always pitting the interest of one group versus the other, whereas the question is how do we create the new ecosystem that actually benefits each, each layer of the, of the pie. Okay, I think we have time for one more question unless one of you has something to add to what Bergeron said. Okay. Good morning. My name is Mwendwa Kivuva. I'm an ISOC ambassador from Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, I see this issue of content development as a chicken and egg situation because now, if you want to set up local data centers, for example, in, the, in Africa, the, there, is also, there is that very big issue of cost, and cost is determined by energy. By energy, I mean electricity. Electricity cost is actually very high because we use renew, renewable energy, and that industry is still coming up. So power cost is very expensive in setting up data centers. Of course, there's the issue of human resource and competence that had been talked about. There's the issue of physical security. Will it, you can set up a data center and thugs come and pick up and go up with your computers, actually. There's also the issue of reliable internet connection. Imagine you have a data center and you don't have 99.99% availability who will want to host content on. So you have actually to have very reliable internet connection to be able to set up such a data center. And, and lastly, actually, there is that issue of return on investment. On the investor who is setting up these data centers, you can actually set up data centers, but will people come and put content there? Now, on the other flip side is on access. If you set up this, these data centers, do we have enough people accessing this content? We, we, we are supposed to, to, have, to, to, have the, to enable access to the masses. So you have, to, you have to have a big chunk of the population being able to access your, your data centers. So you find that because it's, you, can up, you can set up a data center that, what am I trying to say? People, people actually go to, to take, take their content to Europe because you find only very, very few people are, are hosting. So if, if you host locally, it, um, let, let me try actually to read so that I can be more coherent. I, I actually think increasing affordable access will spur content, and if that critical mass, as Batnan was saying, if you don't have that critical mass of people accessing that content, there will not be that return on investment on the data centers you are trying to set up. Thank you. Let me um, quickly say a couple things. You're absolutely right. I mean, most of the times in developing countries, big data centers that are being set up have to meet economies of scale. At points, you know, who's going to use them? So, you know, if there's a bank wants to use it, probably, they're going to say, all right, those, those are the kind of contracts which make it feasible to set up those kind of centers over there. So what ends up happening? Local content producers who don't have that much money who will not, you know, what, what do they do? They go to WordPress. 
they go to YouTube, they go to Facebook, they go to other places, which are hosted abroad. So actually, if you're talking about local content, we're not talking about local you know, big data centers, you'll find that actually it is hosted abroad. So absolutely right. Um, until you reach that critical mass, et cetera. That's why I think if you really want to spark local content, you, know, you need to be, as we said earlier, openly accessible globally. Yeah, just one very quick comment. We've been talking about content so far regarding implicitly text, pictures, images, and so on. When we say content, we should be thinking also other types of content that are not static, that are dynamic, that are services. There are applications, there are new software on demand and everything. This is causing, raising another issue, which is not accessibility, but which is scalability. If you are creating an application in one country that is remote, that is local, and it suddenly catches up like the Sci um, song, and you have a lot of users, you need a cloud service that can ramp up instead of having to pay for your data hosting for your application. And this is incredibly important for innovation. In developing countries that do not have the whole chain of infrastructure, people who want to develop content that is not static, that is applications, that is services that may spread in other regions of the world, they need infrastructure that are cloud-based, that scale up computing power as a service. So just one, I think that was an excellent question. Um, just one observation, anecdote. Um, that there are many pieces to the puzzle that we've discussed here um, throughout this ecosystem, legal, uh, access infrastructure, et cetera. But in many countries, pieces are already in place. And I, I heard someone speaking who uh, kind of has a, a Netflix of Nollywood movies. He streams these Nollywood movies. And he was trying to figure out why he wasn't getting much traction in, in Nigeria. Um, which is an obvious big hub for this, and, and people just weren't buying it. He was hosted abroad, and, and it was just too slow, so people would try it out, and they wouldn't buy it. But he, he couldn't figure out why people were watching his videos, but they were watching them on YouTube. And then um, he went, uh, the, the Nigerian IXP hosted a local content event in Lagos with many high government officials, data centers, etc. And what he learned is that he found out what an IXP was at that event, and he learned that the reason people could watch YouTube was because YouTube was locally hosted and that that's why they could stream it much faster and that's why they were watching it. So he started to put pressure and started to try and find a place to put his content and he's looking in Kenya and other countries as well. Now he's still running into troubles because the prices are high but, but the more people get this education, learn why the things that are hosted locally are working better, the more pressure they'll put. And then there's, there has to be a demand model. There has to be a way of sharing the, the savings from hosting locally to kickstart the whole chicken and egg and, and get the ecosystem moving. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us. And thanks to all of the panelists for some really thoughtful and valuable discussion. And I uh, hope you all have a wonderful IGF. And just as a piece of advertisement, if you're interested in room one at 11, there's a workshop on internet and jurisdiction project, uh, and we'll be discussing the legal environment about, that we've been talking about uh, regarding content, content takedowns, and things like that. Room one at 11 if you're interested.